I have made two videos covering the log4j vulnerability or logforge vulnerability. Everybody was telling me I pronounced it wrong. Anyway, that vulnerability was supposedly fixed in version 2.15. But if you followed the news at the time closely, you know that on the 14th of December, so only four days after the original vulnerability disclosure and the fix in version 2.15, a new CVE was assigned. CVE 2021-45046. And we got a new fix, version 2.16. Now this second CVE is not as bad as the original log for shell vulnerability, but I think it's very interesting and we can learn a lot more about secure software design again. It's going to be worth it, I promise. Chapter one, the new CVE. Here is an earlier version of the CVE description for the new log for JCVE. It was found that the fix to address log4 shell was incomplete in certain non-default configurations. This could allow attackers with control over thread context map input data when the login configuration uses a non-default pattern layout with either a context lookup or a thread context map pattern to craft malicious input data using a JNDI lookup pattern resulting in a denial of service attack. <sighs> what the F was this sentence? I have to admit, when I read this the first time it was released, my brain blanked. I did not understand this at all and it sounded so weird that I was wondering if this is just another bullshit CVE. And it was just a denial of service attack anyway, right? I'm not that excited about DOS issues. But reading reactions on Twitter, it became clear it was pretty legit. And Pwn Tester, for example, wrote on the 16th of December that he managed to bypass the allowed elder post checks in 2.15, which means there is again a remote code execution issue in this version. However, on the following day, I read the tweet from Kevin, Gossy the dog, log4j hype check the new CVE. Only applies in certain non-default configurations. Remote code execution has been demonstrated on Mac OS not reproducible in other test environments, no exploitation seen in the wild, and not many orgs will be hosting web apps on macOS anyway. That confused me more. Only on macOS? What the heck could be responsible for it to only work on Mac? That is super weird. Again, I didn't understand a thing and there was a new fix 2.16 and organizations gonna patch, so I didn't really care. Until Anthony Weems wrote me this DM. Hey, I worked on the local host bypass to CVE 2021-45046. If you end up covering this in part two of your log4j series, I'd be happy to share information about discovery, root cause, etc. My name is Anthony Weems. I'm a principal security engineer at Praetorian, a cybersecurity company. And following the disclosure of the initial log4j vulnerability, me and my team spent most of our time focused on research and development of scanning and detection tools for this vulnerability. Cool, so that collaboration request made me interested and I realized that this CVE is actually pretty interesting. Impact is not that bad, but educationally speaking, it's really good. We can learn a lot from it. Chapter two, disable lockups. Let's start by looking at the fixes for log4shell. Here in the release details for version 2.15, it says, the message lookups feature was disabled by default, but lookups in configuration still work. And a whitelisting mechanism was introduced for JNDI connections, allowing only local host by default. And this wouldn't be the live overflow channel if we wouldn't look deeper into those fixes. So let's look at the two important log4j commits that implemented them. Here's the first one. Log4j2 no longer formats lookups in messages by default. As mentioned in my original Log4j video, this is a great plan. It's always best to put fancy features behind opt-in configurations instead of the other way around. So previously, you could disable lookups in messages, for example, by specifying the percentage %m no lookups, but now it's the other way around. Now you have to explicitly write percentage %m lookups to enable lookups. Also remember from my second log4j video, the original config to disable the lookups wasn't working properly either. 
we figured out that the if case in this format method was not properly checking for the no lookup setting in all cases. So when a developer was using logger.format instead, it would still perform the lookups. And this has all been fixed in this version 2.15. You can see, for example, the format method has been simplified a lot. But turns out there are still other cases where lookups could be performed. For example, lookups in the pattern layout configuration still work. But that's fine. Having lookups here cannot be controlled by an attacker. So that is totally fine. But turns out there's another case where lookups are still processed. And that is with what the CVE was originally about. Chapter 3. Vulnerable Log4j Configurations. This CVE said something about input to thread context map and I had no clue what that meant. So here is Anthony explaining the original CVE to us. This vulnerability applies when an attacker controls thread context map data and when there is a non-default pattern layout with context lookups or thread context map patterns. These are all specific log4j terminology, and we can actually go to the log4j docs to understand a little bit more about what they mean. They allow applications to store data in thread context maps and then retrieve these values in the logging configuration. The example they give talks about an application that stores the login ID of a user in some thread context and then retrieves it when processing logs. And you can see here this pattern layout logs the context login ID of that user. So in the case of this vulnerability, if login ID were attacker controlled, this would be an example of a vulnerable configuration. And that is a good example. A web server might want to set the current user ID or login ID in the thread context to include it in the log layout. This way they can identify log messages generated from certain users. And it turns out if you get attacker controlled data in there, we can still perform lookups. Now, the new version also restricts LDAP to only allow localhost URIs, so we cannot perform the remote code execution attack anymore. We cannot use our own malicious LDAP server. But using LDAP localhost will be very slow because the LDAP connection timeouts. So for each log message, it tries to contact this non-existing localhost LDAP server and that's how we get the denial of service issue. And now we also understand what it means that it only applies in certain configurations. User input has to be passed into such a context. As you can see, the denial of service doesn't seem super critical. Chapter 4. The RCE. The news spread quickly. Turns out it could still be turned into a remote code execution. For that, let's have a look at the second fix that was implemented to mitigate log4 shell. A whitelisting mechanism was introduced for JNDI connections allowing only localhost by default. And here's the commit for it. Restrict LDAP access via JNDI. When we look at the code changes, we can see there that the JNDI lookup function was extended with additional checks. If the URI doesn't start with LDAP, it will error and say log4j, JNDI does not allow the protocol or when the URI host is not in the allowed hosts list, so it's not localhost, we get attempt to access LDAP server not in allowed list. And on first sight, this code looks good, right? We take the JNDI string coming in, parse the URI and check the host name. How could this be bypassed? Anthony Weems will walk us through. Finally, if all of these checks succeed, they pass the original name into the Java lookup function, which ultimately is what's responsible for doing those JNDI lookups. Now, if we look at this function at a high level, there's something sort of interesting that we can observe. So we see that name is the attacker controlled input. In this try block, they parse name into this URI, validate the URI, but then use name down here at the bottom. And this is sort of a dangerous code pattern because the thing that they validated is URI, not name. And presumably, the JNDI lookups need to parse name. If the JNDI lookup parser is different from the java.net URI parser, there might be some sort of issue that lets us bypass this validation. That's what I set out to find, is how does the JNDI lookup 
parse name and determine where to send those LDAP connections. This is an important secure coding lesson. The JNDI URI passed in as a string has multiple components and we are interested in the scheme or protocol and the host. But uniform resource identifiers, URIs, can have a lot more components. In 2018, I made a video called How freaking hard is it to understand a URL? which talks about exactly the same issue. And in this case here, the Java Net URI parser needs to be able to parse a string into those components according to the standard. And this parser is used here to look at the protocol scheme and the hostname. But Anthony had an idea. What if the string passed to the JNDI lookup is parsed differently there than how it was checked here with Java.NET URI? This would be called a parser differential. Chapter 5. Parser differential. I have introduced parser differentials in a few videos before, like the Google Search XSS, the Listor CTF challenge, and the super old binary exploitation episode 7. So does the LDAP lookup parse the URL differently? Or does it internally also use java.net URI? In order to answer that question, we have to jump into the Java source code itself. So I cloned OpenJDK, and began reviewing for the actual code path that leads to an LDAP lookup. That led me to this class, LDAP URL context, and specifically this function. And the function's uh, Java doc explains pretty well what this is doing. It takes a given URL and resolves it to the actual host name and port that it should connect to. And so this is the thing responsible for doing the actual parsing of name. If we jump to this function, we see that this function is effectively taking in the name, which is now called URL, and passing it to this LDAP URL constructor. If we review that constructor, we see they take URL and call this init function, which is actually defined in the superclass URI. Now, the init function of URI just calls parse, and the parse function takes the URI and parses it into a host and port. Okay, as we can see internally, the LDAP connection is not using java.net URI to parse the URL. They have their own string parsing loop. And Anthony noticed that the code for the LDAP URL parsing is very short compared to the actual java.net URI parsing code. You might think that LDAP URL parsing doesn't have to be as complex but if these functions parse a string differently, this can be abused. There is a high chance for a parser differential. And here's how Anthony tried to find such a difference. We're going to use differential fuzzing. Differential fuzzing is the process of taking one input and passing it to multiple different parsers and comparing the parser results. It's exactly the problem that we have in front of us, and we're going to use uh, an existing coverage guided in process fuzzer to do this job. So this fuzzer is called Jazzer. It was the first time I'd used it, but it was relatively straightforward to get up and running. They have a Docker container that you can run and they have plenty of documentation that describes how to create a fuzzing harness. So the basics of this fuzzing harness is a function called fuzzer test one input that simply takes a byte array and processes it. On any exception that's thrown, the fuzzer will catch that and treat that as a crash. This is the actual fuzzing harness that I developed when doing this research. And ultimately it's the fuzzing harness that found the bypass for these local host restrictions. So as you can see here, this function fuzzer test one input takes a string and then tries to parse it with java.net URI and with the JNDI URI parsing class. And that's followed by a few constraints. Some are just sanity checks. So for example, an exception during parsing we want to ignore, or if the host and the protocol scheme is not set, these are all uninteresting. But further down, there is a constraint that the java.net URI parser has to see a host that says localhost. This would pass the check in the lookup function, the host is localhost. But the host seen by the LDAP URI parsing has to be different. In this case, end in exploit.local. As you can see, if both URI parsers would do the same, these two if conditions could never be passed. If it's equal to localhost, it obviously couldn't end in exploit.local. 
So if that is actually the case, there is a parser differential between those two parsers. And so after that, if we found such a diff, we throw an exception to signal to Jazzer Fuzzer that this is a state we are interested in. Now we're at the final step. We're going to run our fuzzer and cross our fingers that it finds the vulnerability so that we don't have to. We'll compile our fuzz harness and run Jazzer. So there we go. Our fuzzer found an input that passes all of the checks and hits that final exception indicating that we've got a bypass for these localhost restrictions. And there we have it. Apparently using a hash in the URI causes the parsers to see a different host name. The LDAP parser includes the pound or hash sign in the host name and the more complex java.net URI parser excludes it. This makes sense because the hash indicates the so-called fragment of a URL. You've probably seen it on several websites before. So proper URI parsing has to understand that. But the minimal LDAP URI parsing didn't include that. So it mistakenly included it in the host name. Chapter 7, macOS only. Now, some of you might probably notice that this looks like an invalid host name, and it technically is. A host name shouldn't contain a hash sign. But when the system tries to establish a connection to that host name, what happens? Turns out when Anthony tried it, it failed. Unknown host exception. So it doesn't seem to be possible to connect to a host name with this invalid character. At this point, I was actually really confused because I thought that I had done the bypass correctly and you know why wasn't this actually working? And it kind of makes sense, you know, this pound sign isn't a valid character in domain names. So at this point, I was a little disappointed, but then a day or so later, I was still thinking about this problem and I actually got to collaborate with another security researcher, Karan Leos. He actually had arrived at the same bypass that I had. And so we shared notes and he was actually able to get these LDAP connections to succeed. So what did Karen do differently? When he did it, the connection worked. How was Karen able to turn this into a full remote code execution? The two compared everything, every Java version, every dependency and example codes, all was the same. But then they figured out what was different. Ultimately, we arrived at a really interesting conclusion, which is he was using Mac OS and I was using Debian. On my Debian system, the Debian DNS resolver was refusing to do these lookups. On his system, as long as the DNS server hosting this domain returned result, macOS was happy to resolve it. And that's why this remote code execution in the new version 215 was only confirmed on macOS. The reason why it only worked on Mac was due to a different DNS resolver used. Now, Kevin is right that not many Java websites are hosted on macOS systems, so that's why you shouldn't panic. But after a bit of research testing on various different systems, Anthony actually found a system that is a lot more realistic. Chapter 8, Impact. But we did test Alpine as well, and Alpine, when you run this, it does do the resolution, which is really cool to see, because I was most worried about the cases of someone running a log4j application in some containerized environment. This verified that Alpine had similar, you know, dangerous DNS resolution that allows these pound signs. Yes. And suddenly this issue got a lot more critical again. Alpine is a very slim Linux system used in containers a lot. So it's very, very likely that people run log4j in such a system. So if they have version 215, they would be vulnerable to the remote code execution if user input is passed into the threat context stuff we looked at first. As you can see, overall the issues in 215 are not as bad as the original log4shell issue. But the severity still increased from the original only denial of service impact. Chapter 9. Conclusion. I think this example is interesting because here was a function trying to make security checks, but it was implemented in an insecure way. Parsing differentials are a huge source of vulnerabilities and they are really fun to find and test for. So keep that threat surface in mind when implementing checks like this. Thanks Anthony for reaching out and collaborating with me on this video. Thanks to you I finally understood what the new log for JCVE 2021-45046 meant 
and I never used Jazzer before, so thank you. That's going to be something I will use a lot more when facing Java.